This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. All righty, welcome back. This first question, as I said, comes to us from a viewer down in Gilbert, and they say, I need help understanding some things that John says about sin and Jesus and the, and the works of the devil in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, particularly the last part which reads, The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. There you go, Mike. <laughs> Have fun with that one. You know, we do answer uh, all kinds of questions. Some are easy, some are surface, some are historical, some are deep. <laughs> and uh, this is one of those very deep questions. Sorry about trying, that. Trying to confuse me yeah, all, yeah, already. Give too much paper. This is, this is one of those deep questions. I'm, this is one of those questions where you may be sitting out there saying, as I begin to answer this, why doesn't he just answer the question? And the reason that, uh, that I have to do some background here is there's a lot, there is a lot for us to understand as foundation before we get directly to the last part of 1 John 3 and verse 8. So as always, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the context of this particular question and uh, then I'll, I'll talk about some of the significant things that I see here. 1 John 3, beginning in verse 4, says, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you, for the one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil is sin from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. I think one of the things that, that uh, we see clearly in verse 5 is a universal acceptance with clarity of what is said in verse 5. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Everybody understands that who understands the scripture, that Jesus came to take away sins, and he did not sin. But where people go astray in this, process, in, in this passage is, is what happens here in, in, um, in verse 8, uh, what happens in verse 6, what he says and implies in verse 6 about our relationship to sin. I don't know if our questioner had this in mind when uh, he wrote to me asking this question, but I recently was listening to a religious program on radio where the individual speaking sa said boldly to the audience, I don't sin. I'm beyond that in my relationship to God. I don't sin anymore. And I, I thought for a moment, did I just hear what I think I heard? And then the confirmation came through the radio waves because the individual was stating that those of us who obtain to certain spiritual heights do not sin anymore. Just don't, it's no longer a problem. And I, I uh, although the, the verse was not quoted, I thought immediately of, of this particular passage. No one who abides in him sins. I can see somebody lifting that out of its context and trying to make an application to a quote-unquote spiritually mature Christian. But let's look at another verse in, in John's writing, 1 John 1 and verse 8, where John says this, 
if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. What is indicated in 1 John 3 is the secret of sinlessness in the life of the child of God. When when John says, no one who abides in him sins, he is stating the truth of our relationship to Christ when we're walking in light. That's 1 John 1 and verse 7. The way that John is describing the Christian life throughout these epistles is a life that is, is consecrated. It's committed. It is true, when I am totally committed to Christ, when I am letting Christ dictate the way that I think, the way that I act, the things that I do, then I'm walking in the light, and I'm not sinning in that activity. We do not sin when we walk in the light. But the instant instant that we forget about His presence, and when I let my own will give direction to my life, then I commit sin. One who is a Christian must be totally committed to God. That's what this section of the scripture is all about. John has already said that if we say that we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us, 1 John 1 and verse 8. So he's gotten that that discussion out of the way. He's simply pointing us to the way that we overcome the difficulties of sin. And that's what's being said in verse 7. According to the Apostle John, righteousness is not a theory. It's not theology. It is practice. You see, this, this is what Christianity is really all about. It's not a, an intellectual process as much as it is a practice. What, what we Christians are to do is to put to practice in our lives what we believe the scriptures teach. It doesn't imply moral perfection. What it implies is practice, 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 and commitment. And there's a, there's a number of interesting things said in verse 8, and let's, let's zero in on that now. Look at verse 8 again. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. One of the interesting things that I want to point out about this before we get to the last part of the verse is that John says, in harmony with everything else that the New Testament teaches us, that the Son of God appeared. I really like the way uh, John talks about his appearance. In other words, uh, a pre-existence is intimated, and in fact, in the original language, the word for appeared is, would even more strongly indicate that than perhaps, um, uh, perhaps uh, what we have here in our English translations. He, Jesus, appeared here on earth to put to death the works of the devil. And over in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, Paul says this. Let's read it. For you know... The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. We know that Jesus was never rich here on earth. So what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9 is is the riches that he experienced previous to this life. And John also writes in John, the first chapter, look at it with me for just a second. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And in verse 14, he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the the thing that we need to tie together here in this place is when 
John says in 1 John 1, 14, the Word became flesh. And then he says in 1 John 3, in verse 8, uh, the Son of God appeared. He's talking about the same thing. The Word of God, Christ who existed in the form of God, Philippians 2, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself, taking on the form of, the, of a bondservant. That's Philippians chapter 2. And, and the Son of God appeared. He gave up his place to come with a purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Here's how the Hebrew writer puts it. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. You see, the Scripture says the Son of God appeared for this purpose, and then the purpose is stated to destroy the works of the devil. And either he accomplished his purpose or he didn't. This is one of the interesting things that I see in theological discussions. Was Jesus able to carry out his purpose when he came to earth or, or because of his rejection by the Jews, does he still have a purpose to carry out when he comes back again? That's one of the doctrines that floats around out there. What Matthew says in Matthew 20 and verse 38 is this, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and he gave his life a ransom for many. Now, here again is that purpose as is stated over in 1 John. Here is the purpose. Jesus knew his purpose before he came to earth. It was his full intention of carrying out his purpose. And the purpose was to come and, and serve, come and pay his life as a ransom for many and destroy the works of the devil. When we come back then in just a second, We'll zero in on what are the, what's the works of the devil then that he's talking about that have been destroyed right here. We'll be back in a second. We want to send you today a free CD that will play in any computer, How the World Will End According to the Bible. Won't you call and write to us? If you're interested to know about how the world's going to end, call or write to us and ask for our free CD. We've talked about the purpose then, and we've looked at a number of passages. What are the works of the devil? What are the works of the devil that Jesus came to destroy? Well, here again, we have to go back in Bible background and context to the very beginning. In the Garden of Eden, the works of the devil were initiated. When Satan, when the devil was able to tempt Eve to sin, when Satan was able to cause Adam to fall. His work began. And he accomplished his work. And as a consequence of his work, physical death came to man. As a result of that sin, we die physically. That was one of the works of the devil. And every sin that has ever been committed and every evil deed that has ever even been imagined is the works of the devil. Every sin committed can be traced back to the devil. The devil wishes to lead all men in rebellion against God. Hebrew writer says this in Hebrews 2, verses 15, 14 and 15. Look at it again. We, we've just looked at it, but look at it again. Therefore... Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. And, and look at another verse in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin 
And so death spread to all men because all sin. You, the point I'm trying to make here, and I'm laboring to give you just glimpses of several different passages to see this, is that death is the work of the devil. It entered into the world as a result of sin that the devil was trying to accomplish as he got Adam and Eve to rebel against God. And what he really wants to do is get us all to rebel against God and then to die in that state. That's really what Satan wants. First he wants to get you to rebel against God and then he wants to take your life while you're in the midst of that rebellion. And he wants to do that to everyone because he's, he's so deluded he believes that that will give him power. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26 says, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Therefore, when 1 John 3 says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, it was that Jesus came to, to render powerless physical death. You see, it, it's kind of, Danny, the, the old statement, um, you can kill a Christian, but you can't hurt him. It's true. <laughs> okay. Uh, somebody could take, if, if you're in the right relationship to God, it doesn't matter when you leave your physical existence. No, it doesn't hurt your relationship to God. But, but the power of death, if it takes you when you're in rebellion against God, th then you have problems. Then you have serious problems. And so that's what First John is talking about. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he demonstrated that God has power over physical death. And there will come a day when we will all be raised physically. And when you die physically, your relationship to God is fixed. If you've been obedient to God and you're walking in the light as he is in the light, then, then your physical death doesn't inhibit or hinder your relationship to God. In fact, what it does is it enhances it. It takes you into God's presence. But if you die in rebellion against God, the scriptures are clear, the work of the devil is to cause your death and separation from God. Jesus has put that to death and will one day put it to death for good, for, for all physical death will cease, all death will cease when Jesus returns for the judgment day. So, we're no longer held captive. We no longer have to fear physical death. As long as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, uh, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us from all sin. 1 John 1, verse 7 and following. I hope that helps you in your Bible study, and we'll look at another one of your questions in just a minute. We thank you for your interest in What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that you will come back to ScripturesSay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.